celebration of that when we gather uh, each and every Sunday, we gather in the presence of a God whose love and forgiveness never runs out. And so as we uh, begin worship this morning, we are invited to uh, into the presence of the God of living waters. I invite you to stand. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with all your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that makes life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children forward at this time for a special children's message. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Do you guys like the rain? No? Kind of? A little bit? All right, so we've been working our way through the Vacation Bible School uh, themes, right, for the last five weeks since we had Vacation Bible School, and we are on the final one, day five. So who can remember what day five of our Operation Restoration VBS was? Belly. Rest. rest. That's right. Rest. The rain kind of feels restful a little bit, doesn't it? Kind of makes you want to take a nap, maybe relax, maybe snuggle on the couch all day. Well, today was actually, we're planning on making today a very active day. We're looking at, we have all these tables out ready uh, that got rained on this morning. And so you'll have to be patient uh, for folks to get set up a little bit out there after worship. But the plan is for everybody to be able to go around all the tables and see all of the activities we do as a church and see how they might want to be involved in doing all these different activities. So that's like an active day. That's a busy day. And then you all started school recently, right? And school is kind of a busy thing, is a doing, going and doing and do, do, do. So then why are we talking about rest on a day like today with all of this activity, looking at all the things we have to do? Yeah, Kate? Okay. Because on day five, um, God rested. Actually, it was day Seven, right? Yeah, but you're right. So uh, when God created the world, God did six days of activity of creating everything, and then on day seven, God rested. And so if God even had to rest, it's pretty important that we have to rest too, right? That we, that we need to rest sometimes. That if we just go and do and do and do all the time and are always active, well, eventually we're going to get tired, right? Has anybody ever slept? Have you ever slept? You slept in today? Yeah. So did we a little bit. Yeah. Maybe it was the rain. So that just proves it that we need rest, right? Because we all have to sleep. And so rest is important for that reason. There's one more reason rest that I want to talk about today that rest is really important. And that's this. It shows us 
that it doesn't depend, that everything in the world of fixing the world doesn't depend on us. In VBS, we talked, it was operation, restoration, mending God's world, right? We talked about how we can be a part of mending, of fixing God's world, but rest reminds us that ultimately we can't fix the world ourselves, that we can help God fix the world, but ultimately it's going to be God who fixes the world. And so we can rest knowing that it's not in our hands to fix everything. It's in God's hands. And it also reminds us that nothing we do could make God love us. God already loves us. And so we don't have to do anything to earn God's love because God already loves us. And so even when we do all of these activities and all of those ministries out there that, that we're going to invite people to participate in today, we know all along that none of that, none of our activity, none of your schoolwork, none of your chores are what makes God love you because God already loves you. And so we can rest because we know that God loves us no matter what. And it doesn't depend on what we do. God's, God, we can rest in God's love and that knowledge that God loves us no matter what. So that's why we talk about rest on a day like today, even as we think and talk about all of the busyness and all the things we can do together as the church to be the church together, and all those things are important, but just as important is rest. Let's pray. Dear God, we give thanks that you rested on the seventh day to uh, teach us that we need to rest as well and for teaching us that uh, nothing we do can um, earn us your love because you already love us no matter what. Uh, through your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up today. I think we've got Sunday school or children's church with, uh, with Josiah. If you're headed to children's church today, you can go with him. Otherwise, you can stay in worship as well. And our worship will continue now with our readings. Our first reading today is from Ezekiel chapter 33. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you shall, saved, you shall have saved your life. Now you mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The word of the Lord. Be Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, If another member of the church sins against you, 
go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on, on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit of truth. Amen. Well, for those who prefer sermons that have a really concrete, practical application, this is the most practical advice Jesus ever gave. And all we really need to gain that practical advice is one verse. Verse 15, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. Sometimes when I read this text in worship, I just want to stop there. That's all we need. So many problems in our lives and in the world would be, fo would be solved if we could just follow this one teaching. This section of Matthew's gospel here in Matthew 18 has historically been used uh, to guide issues of church discipline uh, when there's church conflict in, in a congregation. And it's, it is important for that, but I also think it's helpful for life outside of church. It's really uh, for healthy relationships with anyone at all in your life. If you could just follow this teaching, life would be so much better, so much cleaner, so much less conflict. If you have a problem with someone, if someone has done something or said something to hurt you, go to them directly. Anytime human beings live together in community, there is guaranteed to be conflict. That's just a part of life, a part of sinful human nature. And the closer we dwell together in community, the more that conflict is lightly, likely. If any of you have, have multiple kids, you know this to be true, right? The, the people that are closest to us are the ones that we are most likely to have conflict with. And being the church, living life as the church together does not make us immune to this. We are still a community of people made up of sinful individuals. So anytime we get together and live in community, including in the church, there will be conflict. That's a virtual guarantee. The question is, what happens then? What happens next after we hurt one another as we inevitably will? What happens after someone does something to anger us? And that's what separates us from the world. What happens next after the hurt, after that initial conflict, is what can make us a witness to the world around us. Now here's what Jesus didn't say. If a brother or sister sins against, that's the literal Greek language we see, uh, just to make it non-gendered, if another member of the church sins against you, it, the, the Greek there says, if, if a brother sins against you. So we might say, if a brother or sister sins against you, here's what Jesus didn't say, hold it inside and privately resent that person. If a brother or sister sins against you, avoid interacting with them at all costs. Just forget about that relationship and move on. If a brother or sister sins against you, go and complain about it to your friends. Maybe send one of them to talk to that person, but under no circumstances, talk to them directly. There's a name for that, by the way. It's called triangulation. Let's illustrate this. I need a couple volunteers. Don't worry, it won't hurt. 
a couple volunteers. Glenn, I see you moving. One more, one other person. All right, Christy, go ahead and stand up. Let's make a triangle here. So Glenn, you can stand on that side. Christy on that side, a little further away so everybody can see us. All right, so uh, let's say um, Christy did something to make me upset. Um, she said I wasn't a very good pastor, and she's upset that I was called to, to community Lutheran. I don't know. I'm just making this up. But Christy said something to offend me, and, uh, well, and, I, and I heard about it. She didn't say it to me, but I heard about it. So what do I do in response? I go and talk to Glenn. Glenn, can you, <laughs> did you hear what Christy said about me? Did, I cannot believe that she would do that. Can, this is so, can you believe it? Oh, my, so ridiculous. Well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. So who in that instance can prevent the triangulation? Obviously, the ideal situation would be that I had gone to her directly, but who is best positioned in that circumstance to actually stop the triangulation? Glenn. Glenn can be the one to say, you know, Pastor Matt, maybe you should talk to Christy about it directly. And that would stop the triangulation because what are the chances that Christy doesn't even know that something she did made me upset? And now there's a barrier in that relationship that she's not even maybe aware of. And so when we are the person that's called being triangulated, so Glenn is the person being triangulated in that moment. And this is a really hard thing to tell, to, to, to read and to, uh, to figure out that this is what's happening sometimes. In the moment, you don't always see it because you just see a person who's been hurt and you want to have compassion on them. Uh, but the most healthy thing to do for community would be for Glenn in that instance or when someone comes and complains to us about someone else, just to say gently, you know, have you thought about going and talking to them about this? Thank you for our volunteers. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. And that's exactly the process that Jesus lays out here. When you have a conflict with someone, when you are hurt by someone something did, something someone did or said, go to them directly. That's something we need to build up courage to do. It's not easy to do, right? It's an easy teaching to understand. It's not an easy teaching to live out. But there's a couple other key points that Jesus makes here. When the two of you are alone, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone in private. Not embarrassing them by pointing out the fault, by pointing out the hurt in front of other people, but alone, just between the two of you. And it has to be done in love with the goal of reconciliation. If the goal is to get back at them by making them feel horrible about themselves, then you're not ready yet. You're not ready to go and talk to them. I mean, and a couple, a couple more tips about this process of when you're going to talk to someone about something that you've been hurt by, one thing is to use I statements, right? Um, I was really hurt when you did this, when you said this, to talk about your own feelings, because if you start talking about the action itself, then the person can easily just become defensive and that, that there can be friction in that interaction in the moment. And so versus saying accusing, you know, you did this to me. So, Here's how I felt when you said this, when you did this, or even worse, possibly, universalizing it. You always do this. Well, that's just a recipe for someone to put up their defenses immediately, right? So if you just stick with how you are feeling in that as a result of those specific circumstances, then you're reaching out in love toward that person with the goal of reconciliation, with the goal of healing in that relationship. And then Jesus says, if they listen to you, 
you have regained that brother or sister. In other words, if they recognize that their action caused hurt, whether intended or not, intention is not the issue here. The issue is that someone has been hurt by the actions of another. So if they are able to recognize that, they see the breakdown that that's causing in relationship, they see they're recognizing that you hope for restoration in that relationship, then hopefully they'll begin to take steps along with you to move toward that reconciliation. That step alone, if we just live that out, I believe that could solve 99% of interpersonal conflicts in our lives. If we just had the courage to talk to each other. And I've witnessed this time and time again, that if two people have had a, uh, and usually in, in my line of work, it's two church members who have, who have uh, had a conflict with each other, if I can just get them to sit down together at the table, Two reasonable people will work it out. I, I've seen this time and time again. And doing that, going directly to that person, is ultimately an act of love. Even though it's hard, even though it's, it's hard sometimes to build up that courage to go directly to the person, it's actually an act of love because you are moving toward reconciliation in that relationship. You're not allowing the wound to fester and create more and more separation in that relationship. Now, a disclaimer here, there is one exception to this. In the situation of abuse, that's different circumstances entirely. And this teaching doesn't apply in quite the same way. You wouldn't, in that circumstance of ongoing abuse, you wouldn't go to the abuser directly. Instead, you would get help, because in that situation, the person has already been refusing to see how they're hurting you. And also, we'll talk about this more next week. Next week is kind of a forgiveness part two. Uh, but forgiving someone doesn't necessarily mean the relationship goes back to what it was before. Uh, sometimes for that wound to heal, that it's best for both parties or that relationship looks different than it was before. Uh, but that's, that's more for next week. Our focus today is those little bit more minor conflicts and hurts that we do to each other in community uh, to go to the person directly. And, and Outside of the circumstances of, of abuse, there might still be times when, for whatever reason, even if you do your best to go to the person in love, seeking reconciliation, using your I statements and about how, you, how the person's actions made you feel, um, there might be times still when the person will not acknowledge how their actions have caused harm to you, just how, how they're, they've got those defenses up. And so Jesus then, and again, hopefully this is only rare, hopefully we never need to go beyond that first step. But Jesus does include a, a next step just in case we need it. Step two, bring two or three witnesses so that every word may be confirmed. And if we take that step, there were, uh, those extra people that we bring along to talk to the person are not there to, conf to, to team up on them but to confirm that you, the person who's going to them, are being reasonable and that you are really trying to move toward reconciliation. And, and hopefully in that situation, the person can finally overcome their pride and enter into that real conversation with you about that hurt that was caused. And if not, Jesus does give one further option, and this one is specifically for the life of the church, and it, it is bring it to the church. In Matthew's context, in the original gospel, uh, when the gospel was written, that would have been a, a small house church, most likely. Bring it to, the, to your small group community. In our context, it's more likely that you would bring it to the leadership of the church in some way, um, whether pastor or uh, uh, president of the congregation or even um, having to go beyond that if the conflict is with leaders of the congregation uh, to someone like a bishop. Um, but the process there, there is a process laid out both in the scriptures and then even in our governing documents that in that situation, if it got to that point, uh, there's a process laid out where all parties would have a chance to speak and, and tell um, 
how they're viewing the circumstances and to tell their side of the story. And again, hopefully it never gets to that point, but the process does lay out a procedure then for if you had to exclude someone from community in the extreme case where they refuse to stop behavior that is harmful to others. And so there is a process for that laid out. And Jesus uh, names that um, there in verse 17. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And let such, if they still refuse, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And that sounds really harsh, right? It's, it sounds like we're excluding them completely from community. And in a way we are. But even then, even the goal of that action is still reconciliation, ultimately. And it's interesting that Matthew, the, 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 who's this gospel is named after was himself a tax collector. And the Gentiles and tax collectors would be the very people that this early Christian community were trying to reach. And so this isn't just let them be anathema, let them be just excluded from community forever. Let them be as someone who you are trying to reach with the good news of the gospel, with the good news of God's reconciling love. In other words, that effort to move toward reconciliation never stops. This, then, is how the community of faith, how the church can be different than the world around us. Again, hurts will happen within the church. We will not forever be a community without conflict. That's impossible. What makes us different is what happens next, after the initial hurt that instead of brushing it aside, instead of trying to get back, trying to get even, instead of passively, aggressively going and complaining to someone else, we go and talk to the person directly. We do this because reconciliation or healing of relationship is at the heart of who God is. That first reading from Ezekiel can seem pretty harsh. It's talking about death a lot and how if the prophet doesn't speak a word of warning, then the people's blood, their punishment will be on his hands. But at the very end of this passage in verse 11, God is speaking and says this, as I live, and that's a phrase that means at the core of who I am, at the core of my being, God says, as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And so the picture that's painted here is that the house of Israel, God's chosen people, are pursuing actions that ultimately lead to death, and that is not what God wants. At the core of who God is, is restoration. And so God's confrontation of us, God's judgment of us, is never an end in itself. It is always with the goal, it is always, the, the judgment, the confrontation is always a step toward the goal of restoration, toward healing in relationship. We have a God who never gives up on us. The God of second chances who, no matter what happens, always invites us back. May we give that same gift to one another. The gift of second chances in relationship. And when we do, it's not only our relationship with each other that is affected, but that then becomes a part of the church's witness in the world. It shows the world that while we are by no means perfect in the church, we are a community of forgiven and forgiving sinners. And there's nothing the world needs more than that. Amen. Our worship continues as we sing together our hymn of the day. I invite you to stand.
Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we profess our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. Hold us accountable, O God. Show your church where repentance is needed and lead us in paths of intentional compassion and listening. Help us extend hands of reconciliation and care in all our relationships. Merciful God, reveal your miracles to us, O God. Move us to cherish you as we behold the wonders of creation. Renew the seas and the soil, the forests and the creatures that live in them. Turn us to ways of living that seek earth thriving. Merciful God, inspire us to lead with honor, O oh God. Guide judges and legislators, police and government officials to create and uphold just laws. Move us to treat all people with dignity and guide our conversations with one another. Merciful God, help us comfort those who suffer, O oh God. Reassure any who are harmed by the wicked acts of others. Bring peace to all who are vulnerable, sick, frightened, or despairing, especially Danilo, Margaret, Dan, Pat, all those on our prayer chain, and those we name before you now, aloud or in our hearts. Guard their waking and their sleeping. Merciful God, awaken us, O oh God. Challenge and encourage your people to value the vocation to which each is called. On this day of Taste of CLC, lead each of us into discerning new possibilities of service, both in the church and in our community, even as we find our rest in you. In all our diverse callings, teach us to love our neighbor above all else. Merciful God, be our hope, O oh God. We remember with thanksgiving your disciples who died in faith. May their trust in your promise be our protection and our hope. Merciful God, remember us according to your steadfast love, O oh God, as we offer these and, our, and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion, made known through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to take a moment to share that peace through greeting those around you.
You may make your way back to your seats at this time. So that, that time, by the way, the passing of the peace was originally in the liturgy in order to follow this teaching that we just talked about. It was a time, they originally instituted the peace in the liturgy as a time for uh, members of the church to go be reconciled to one another before going to the table, before coming to the table. And so that was the original meaning of the passing of the peace. All right, so uh, a few announcements to share with you this morning. And uh, um, Kathy is illustrating our new message method of announcement giving uh, this morning. So what we're, um, when, if you are the, and I wanted to do this today because with Taste of CLC, hopefully everyone who kind of leads a ministry or mostly is, is here today, uh, but our new method of, of um, giving, when you have an announcement to give about a ministry here at, at CLC, if you can kind of line up over by the piano, and that way Josiah or I and whoever is kind of giving announcements can, can bring you up at the, at the most convenient time, at the most appropriate time to give that announcement. We, and we're asking for those to stay, and there's always exceptions to these rules, uh, but most of the time, as a rule, to stay within about 30 seconds in that uh, announcement, um, and then uh, uh, two weeks, so two consecutive weeks of the same announcement um, is what we're asking. So there's always, again, always exceptions to that with certain events that are coming up, uh, but as a general rule, uh, that's the kind of practice that we're looking for for announcement time. So I'm going to let Kathy go first. Can she use that microphone, Josiah, please? Thank you. Good morning. Um, at Pastor Matt has been talking about the day of service, God's work our hands over the last several weeks. And as you know, it's a two day, October 7th and 8th. But on Sunday the 8th, the charity we are going to be uh, sponsoring this year is called Souls for Souls. So you can guess, Souls for Souls. So it's basically a nonprofit that accepts new and used, gently worn, men, women, and children's shoes, and then they distribute them to, come to, put, to actually the places around the world for places in need. So all um, this year we're going to be just start going through your closets and gathering up your shoes, um, all types, sandals, high heels, tennis shoes, whatever you have, start collecting them, and then we're going to have some large cardboard boxes out here at the church next Sunday, and you can just start unloading them pretty much now through the day of the event, October 8th, and then what we're going to do is organize all the shoes, probably by size and Perfect. gender, whatever. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, and I'll have, I have a sign-up sheet. I'll be out there at the outreach table, and I'm serving a breakfast casserole, so you can stop by and hear about other things we're doing. <laughs> For God's Work Our Hands Day, right? Yeah. All right. And I think it looks like Sarah has an announcement as well. This is my annual Yes Choir rehearsals are starting and please come join us. I'm a music teacher and I've been teaching um, music lessons uh, to people who have no experience for many years. If you come and join us, you can try it out. I can teach you how to read music. We'd love to have you. And what are rehearsal times now? Oh, rehearsal times are Thursdays at 6.45. This week? This week? Starting this week. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Uh, let's see. You heard about God's Work Our Hands coming up October 7th and 8th. Um, do you want to say something about the Baja trip real quick? Uh, yeah, we got a Baja trip that will be that Saturday. We're going to be going to Door Faith Orphanage and making lunch. So if you're interested and want to learn more, you can go to the Baja table, talk to Raul or myself, and we'd love to share more. And go we ahead. have yep, a couple. Uh, we're starting kids' night out, so preschool age kids come this Saturday night. Um, let your kids play, you go out. If you have neighbors, let them know about it. Confirmation starts this Wednesday. We're looking forward to that. There's more information in the bulletin. And then we're going to kick off our high school youth ministry next Sunday afternoon. Um, so yeah, a lot of good things starting. If you have more questions, feel free to come talk to me at my table out on the patio. Lots of good stuff happening for the fall for all ages. And uh, we're starting regular Sunday school next week as well after worship, right? So we'll have the nine o'clock, during the nine o'clock service, we'll have children's church and then a dedicated Sunday school time uh, at 1015 after worship as well, starting uh, for, for children, uh, 1015 to 11 starting next week. Um, and then quilting, that's tomorrow. You got that up there. Anything else? 
Yeah. And I think uh, that's all we need to share with you today. And um, this is the time of our offering. If you brought a physical offering with you today, that can be placed in the basket behind the baptismal font uh, in the back. And it is your offerings um, that uh, cause, um, that, that feed the, the activities and ministries of this congregation. And so uh, we give thanks for uh, everyone who participates in community in any way, uh, but in that way in particular. And um, we're excited to have the bells back today. So a piece from our bell choir. You all are in mid-season form already. Beautiful job. Please stand.
great spirit within me. Let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, O God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opens to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In this meal of Holy Communion, we are reminded that at the core of who God is, at the core of God's very heart, is forgiveness. And so God sent God's heart into this world, in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, to draw us back to himself. And Jesus gives himself for us so that we may be reconciled to God. And so in this meal, we remember the night in which he was betrayed, how our Lord Jesus took bread blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup together, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O oh God, we pray for the gift of your Holy Spirit in our gathering, in this meal, among your people, throughout the world. All blessing, praise, and thanks be to you, holy God, through Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, in your church, in your world, without end. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You are invited to share in this meal where we receive God's grace in the flesh together. Communion this morning will be distributed down on the floor. And so as you come forward, you'll receive first the bread to then dip in either the red wine or the white grape juice. If you'd like to uh, pause in prayer, you can do so at the altar rail before, before returning to your seat. Come and know Christ, broken and poured out for you. You may be seated.
Now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. 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 Please stand. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Jesus Christ, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.